Hi, the topic for today is multiple sclerosis and heat sensitivity. If we haven't met yet, my name is Pam Bartha and I'm the author of Become a Wellness Champion and the founder of Live Disease Free. The topic of heat sensitivity is a really big deal with respect to not just multiple sclerosis, but all kinds of other chronic diseases. And the key is that like what I'd like to do today is to just start to talk about this and to start to think with common sense and to maybe there's some possible causes for this. And the good news is that we have seen with our students, with the wellness champions that have recovered from chronic disease, that they can tolerate heat again. So you'll be able to, as you treat the cause, you should be able to go out and enjoy the outdoors again and the heat and exercising more aggressively. So with multiple sclerosis, and I'll be talking a lot about MS today, I just want to say hello to a few people. Hi, Jill and Troy and Danielle. You guys can all hear me. Hi, Rudy and Adrian. So please put your comments, your questions in the box. Maybe I'm talking about a topic that affects you a lot, heat sensitivity. And so if that affects you, please let me know. And also, please share this with other people that you know are suffering with chronic disease and they are really sensitive to the heat. And it's a real awful thing because it really causes us to close down or, or narrow down our the things that we do we become more isolated so with multiple sclerosis in time the vast majority of people do become sensitive to heat so that would mean if they were let's say outdoors in the summertime when there's it's really hot outside or maybe they are trying to keep up their exercise routine and their body is heating up things like that so or fever, like if you get a cold and you get a high fever, what happens is whenever our body heats up, when we have multiple sclerosis and we become sensitive to heat, we notice that some of our symptoms become stronger. So we could have more fatigue, our balance could be worse off, we could have stronger tremors, we can have cognitive impairment, so a lot more loss of memory or confusion, things like that. The good news is that these symptoms do settle down as we cool down our body. And so a lot of us are wondering, why are we dealing with this? Why are we suffering with these horrible symptoms? When we have this heat intolerance, then when our family and friends are out having fun outside or, or you know, going in and outside, going to the beach, going to parks, etc., it really limits our life. And we end up staying indoors. We stay in air, condition, air conditioning and we become more isolated. It's part of the process of chronic disease. We become more isolated and it makes us more sad and depressed. And the good news is you don't have to live like that if you treat the cause, if you treat infections. So with, with heat sensitivity, um, I just wanted to share a couple of things here. So what causes it? There, if you just look at the traditional standard of care for chronic diseases, and we talk about heat sensitivity, then they say it's like a physiological response of your body. It could be your autonomic nervous system, but it's basically your body is reacting to whatever's causing the disease, the, the disease process. So that doesn't really help us a lot, right? That's something that's with all diseases. It's like, we don't know what causes it. We don't, there is no cure. And so it's kind of like, it's almost like explaining really what we're going through. Yes, there is a change in physio physiology, but it doesn't really help us with the cause. So we really don't know what it would be. And so one other thing is that with medication, medications can cause symptoms like this. So it is, it's either part of the disease process that we're suffering with, or it could be medication. And my theory, which is a pretty strong theory, is that it is caused by infections. And so it could be that the infections are causing a physiological change, but it's really that I believe that the infections don't like the heat. And I'm gonna share a few reasons why I believe that. And this is something that we should be talking about. So chronic disease, has become such a mystery and there's so many autoimmune diseases there's over 80 autoimmune diseases and after so many years of research and spending millions of dollars we still have no idea what chronic disease and what autoimmune disease is caused by but then if you start to follow some of the material that i share that 
chronic disease and multiple sclerosis is caused by chronic infections in the body. And I didn't come up with this. I'm just really good at putting pieces of the puzzle together. So if we consider that chronic disease is the cause of MS and other disease, but we'll just talk about MS here, then just what I did is I did a little bit of digging and we're gonna do a blog about this on my Live Disease Free website. But if you do a little bit of digging yourself, you'll see that Things like, okay, let me backtrack for a minute. So I have linked multiple sclerosis with parasitic infestations and Lyme disease and fungal overgrowth. And there could be other infections that we're not aware of right now, but definitely those three are the big players that are really standing out. And as people treat them, they recover and they have amazing lives. Um, and the sooner we treat it, the lot easier it is to treat them for sure. So we know, I should say, science knows that Borrelia, which is the bacteria that causes Lyme disease, it is heat sensitive. And so there is this technique in, I think it started in Germany, where they heat the body up to, I think it's over 40 degrees Celsius. So they heat the body, it's called hypothermia, uh, or hy hyperthermia, sorry, it would be higher. So hyperthermia where they increase the body temperature and they do it in a very safe manner because if, you, if our body gets too hot, we could die. So they do it under medical supervision and people with, with Lyme disease, they have a lot of symptom improvement. I don't know if it always cures it, but what I've seen is that it can be really, really helpful. So Lyme does not like really high temperatures and it can only live in a certain temperature. Then there's also the nematodes. So I've shared with you the work of Dr. Alan McDonald in some of my previous videos. Make sure to go watch like the cause of multiple sclerosis. I've got a ton of free content and videos talking about the different types of infections on our Live Disease Free channel on YouTube and also on Facebook. And if you subscribe on um, Facebook or sorry, on YouTube, if you want to hear more trainings that we're doing regularly, then just make sure to subscribe there. So Dr. Alan McDonald is a pathologist in the United States who came up with this, or discovered, I should say, this incredible groundbreaking research where he found parasitic worms, very small ones, in the central nervous system of people that suffer with MS. And that is shocking because for over 100 years or around 100 years, veterinarians have known that when these little worms get into the central nervous system of domestic animals, that would be cats and dogs and horses and cattle and sheep and goats, etc. Those animals have identical symptoms to those people that suffer with MS. They will have things like paralysis and numbness and weakness in legs and drop foot and spasticity and balance issues and blindness and extreme fatigue. It is shocking how similar. And there is more to this, right? There is this connection between Borrelia and some of the other vector-borne infections and the nematodes, et cetera. But the key is that these nematodes are probably present very, very often in not just multiple sclerosis, but in other neurological diseases. Why do I say that? Because I have students with PLS and other neurological diseases that are treating parasites, nematodes, and they are having incredible symptom improvement. So knowing, and I just want to also add one more thing, that one of my students, I, at least a year ago, maybe two years ago from Europe, medical student had multiple sclerosis and then another person that she knew had MS and she looked at her blood and the other person's blood and she took pictures under the microscope because she found small nematode worms in her blood. So what I believe and what the research is showing too is that a lot of times we will have various parasites in our body and these small nematodes, they will grow in probably our intestines, but also in the blood. And if they're in the blood, we can have things like chronic fatigue and maybe fibromyalgia. And when they cross into the central nervous system, that's when we get more neurological diseases. And when you really study the neurological diseases, you see that there's a lot of similarity between the symptoms for things like ALS and PLS and MS and Parkinson's. There are differences for sure, but there are a lot of similarities also. So knowing that 
little parasitic nematodes are probably very, very common problem with multiple sclerosis. One of the infections that have to be treated, it's a parasitic infestation. And I can just say too that with my students, that um, they're also passing hookworms and all kinds of roundworms and whipworms. And I don't know about the hookworms. It was whipworm for sure that was identified, but roundworms, lots of them. So the research shows that worms, the nematodes, are sensitive to heat. That's actually one of the ways that they find their host. There was one thing that I just wanted to share with you. Uh, where is it here? It was really shocking that the worms could notice. Here it is. Some of the nematodes, like when they're getting close to their host, they can actually notice a difference of 0 0.09 degrees Celsius per centimeter squared. So they are very sensitive to heat. And what I believe, and this is, this is my theory, is that because nematodes and para these parasites are bigger than Lyme disease, so they're much, much bigger, and because they are sensitive to heat also, they probably are, I would assume, the biggest factor in the, like, as we become overheated, they don't like that. And then they probably move around a lot more and cause more inflammation. And then we end up with stronger symptoms. And then as we cool ourselves down, then those symptoms settle down again. It makes perfect sense to me. And another reason why is that when my students are treating these various infections, they're treating fungus, they're treating Lyme, they're treating parasites, they can handle the heat again. They can be outside in really high temperatures around the pool, at the beach, playing. I know Lisa May was sharing that she was out with on the farm throwing the, her nieces and nephews around in the heat, 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 and it was in the high 30s um, around some straw bales, et cetera, just throwing them into some loose straw, having fun with the nieces and nephews again. And she had a history of multiple sclerosis. And I know with um, Sarah, she was able to, she's been able to run 10 kilometer races. And yeah, you get overheated when you're running a 10 kilometer race. She's all beat red, but she did it. And she's run two already. Marie Grace ran her first 5K after years, at least 20 years of multiple sclerosis and progressive multiple sclerosis. And so all these people can tolerate the heat again. And that's the exciting thing is that I believe that it is maybe the Lyme is more active or rebelling against it too, but it's just that the worms are so much bigger. And I believe that we would feel that a lot quicker, right? Because they're bigger. So what can we do, right? What can we do to Really, number one, if we are sick right now, and if we are suffering with multiple sclerosis or some other neurological disease, number one is because you're sick right now, then do get some sunshine, but do it early in the morning and do it later on in the afternoon. Well, maybe not in the afternoon because it might still be hot, depending where you live. But if it's cooler in the evening or morning, go outside. If it's in the morning, you can get some sunshine, you can get your vitamin D. That's the best source of vitamin D. If you find that you're overheating yourself, then cool shower, um, gel packs, um, ice packs, just putting ice in a plastic bag and wrapping it in a towel and using that. Anything to cool yourself down. Air conditioning, obviously. So, But the key is that that's not a life for us. We want to be able to come and go in the heat because I know we have students in Texas right now and it's just smoking hot out there. So the key is to treat the cause of your disease. That is what you have to do if you want to be able to tolerate heat again. And my, the wellness champions are doing it. I, I was lucky for myself. I was diagnosed with MS and I did catch it early enough. So I didn't, I wasn't part of the you know, 60 to 80 percent or 70 to 80 percent of people that end up with sensitivity to heat. But the key is that if you treat infections, then and you treat them well, right, and you treat them effectively, and the sooner you treat them, the quicker you can recover. But you should be able to, because many of the wellness champions are doing it, be able to handle the heat again. And then you open up your life. You can start doing so many more things with your family members and your friends and you can go for hikes and you can start to go for those runs again, et cetera, or bike rides, whatever it is. And being out at the beach. I love being at the beach. It's just amazing. 
or if you have a swimming pool. So anyhow, the key is to treat infections. And that is the biggest frustration we have right now because it's such a new topic and there are very few practitioners that are skilled at treating these infections. So what I would do if, if this is the first time you've met me is watch some of my training videos. I give, I have, there's over 70 videos and I, there's a five or six part series on the different types of infections that are causing multiple sclerosis and different types of diseases. Watch those. And then what I eat is really popular to understand, again, everything, it, it makes so much sense because the eating plan is so powerful. Why? Because we greatly reduce the food to those infections. Who are the biggest eaters? The parasites, the worms, right? And they're, remember that my students are passing lots of large worms, small worms. There's thread worms. There's the little tiny nematodes that are in their blood and in their central nervous system. So there's, I want you to consider that if you have chronic disease, that it is, a, it's a situation of dysbiosis, where you're really out of balance. That is how we become susceptible to Lyme disease. And we become more susceptible to viruses, right? We become more susceptible to the smaller, smaller microbes when our immune system is so overwhelmed from the bigger microbes that have moved out of the gut and into different parts of the body. So the key is to treat infection. So again, if you're new, watch some of my videos. If you're at the place like Pam, what you're saying makes sense. I have watched lots of your videos or maybe you have spent a fortune on your health trying to get well, but you've never treated infections, especially the parasites, right? And that is something that's quite new. And that's what I help people in the live disease free system. And that is how the wellness champions have been getting their health and their life back is not just candida, right? And not just Lyme disease. People focus on treating Lyme and they, the antibiotics just don't work and they end up still becoming disabled. So the key is treating the big parasites and small and knocking back fungus several cycles. And then if necessary, you have to treat those bacterial infections, but they're a lot easier to treat. All right, I'm going to go to see if you guys have any questions. Um, but anyhow, so there, I do have a free training. And if you're at that place where you're like, Pam, I want to be a wellness champion, I'd really like to work with you, then watch the masterclass training. And it'll be posted in the top of this video and on the side. And you can become a wellness champion right away. So I'm going to see if there's any question, questions. Thank you, Adrian. You're so kind. <laughs> it's like five minutes to get ready. Okay, so this is a shorter topic. Uh, sometimes we go for an hour, but this is a really important topic because it really makes people feel horrible. So it's my dog training. Oh, sorry, I'll have to go back up because that doesn't make any sense. Thank you for all the love. Thank you for all the interaction. Make sure you guys share this with other people so that they can understand why they feel so horrible. Hey, hi, Swati from India. Hi, Rob. Hi, David. And Patricia, hello. Hi, Danielle. You are so kind. Thank you. Hi, Mia. Hi, Robert. Okay. You can't handle the heat, Rob. You have parasites, to, you have to treat the parasites a lot more aggressively, for sure. Hi, Jill. Oh, I just wanted to share one other thing too, which is really cool. A lot of people, I don't know about a lot, but several people that suffer with chronic disease, they don't sweat. And when they treat the infections, they can start to sweat again. And it feels so good to sweat again. So it's awful when you're working out and you're really not sweating. Yeah, you guys can relate to that. So th that's another thing that we see. As we treat these infections, as we restore balance well enough, then we find that we can actually sweat. And it feels so good. So Jill, um, he does affect you also. And you do feel like you're sweating most of the time, even 60 degrees. So you will find that as I know you're getting ready to treat, that as you really treat the infections, that will improve tremendously and should go back to normal. Hi, Alexander. Yes, the, that is true for, for probably like up to 80% of people that suffer with MS is that their symptoms become worse when their body gets overheated. And again, 
it makes perfect sense that if we know what the cause is, if it is infection, which it is, because there's just too many of us that have recovered, then you can understand that they're not going to feel very comfortable when they're overheated in you. And so that's why we need to get them out. Austin, Texas is always very hot and it's really tough for you. So Alexander, you need to treat parasites. You need to treat the infections. Hi, Maureen. Hi, Pam. Hi, Swati. You can hear. Awesome. Uh, Jordan, uh, Jonathan. Hi, Anne. You lost volume. I hope my volume was up. Yes. Oh, gee. I hope that was loud enough for you. No problem that you're late, Kelly. It's all recorded. If you missed it, it's recorded. Hi, Mary Lou. Hi, Anne. Hi, Kim. Hi, Don. Wendy, Susie, Anne. See if there's another question. Why can't you take a deworming medication to get rid of them? Yes, you can. Absolutely. But the problem is, um, like, you can probably find, like, in Canada, we can find something for pinworms and roundworms. But again, they're only setting it up so that you're taking it for like a one time shot, or maybe it's for one to three days. And when we have a disease like multiple sclerosis or any neurological disease, the, it's usually parental palm weight or mebendazole, depending on what country in the world you live in. They'll have something for pinworms, just for intestinal parasites, but they will not have available over the counter to treat systemic deep-rooted parasitic infestations, unfortunately. And if you're in a different country and you end up with a certain the microfilarial diseases where it's causing blindness or swelling of the lymphatic like that elephantitis, then those doctors, rec they'll recognize just a couple of diseases that are caused by worms, but they won't for other. But the cool thing is we've been learning a lot from studying all of those different diseases that we know are caused by very similar parasites and, and especially what happens in animals. So the key is that in the live disease free system that we have, Number, please be aware that the, the treatments are not perfect. They're not going to just sterilize you from parasites, like just one treatment, because there's eggs, there's biofilms, there's all kinds of reasons. So number one, you have to stop feeding the infections. It's very, very powerful. So on, watch some of my videos on YouTube. And then um, I have a book, uh, Become a Wellness Champion. It's on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. And then we have to support the body. So there's lots of steps in making sure we're sleeping, making sure we're dealing with the constipation, making sure we've removed mold from our environment and radiation. I talk a lot about these things on the videos that I have. And then another thing that we have to do is, so we've stopped feeding them, supporting the body. We look at our symptoms. And if we have a lot of symptoms of parasites, especially moving into the central nervous system, then we have to work with somebody. And that's what I help people do in the academy. And I have students all over the world. So it doesn't matter where you live. I can help you to get access to practitioners and treatments, et cetera, and how to use them safely. This is a skill that we have to learn. It's such a fundamental, basic thing to understand how to manage the microbes that live in your body, how to keep the good ones up, how to keep the bad ones down. And it's something that we've never learned. And yes, this field of science, understanding how the microbes that live inside of us, how they affect us in health and sickness, that is truly the biggest, most exciting field of science today. But the problem is, is that it's going to take so long before they come up with answers. And so the wellness champions that work with me, we are building a network of practitioners and we are trying to bring change as quickly as possible. I know that there are some clinics that you can go to, but they're really super expensive in the United States and they charge anywhere between thirty to eighty thousand dollars for up to three months. So the, the most cost effective way is to learn this yourself. And that's what we do in the live disease free system. So watch my videos, um, reach out, watch the training video that we'll have linked in the, the feed here and make sure to reach out to me if you are ready to take back your health and life and become a wellness champion. See if there's any other questions. Thank you, Danielle. And Danielle is somebody who is amazing. She is somebody who beat her MS. She's a wellness champion, and she is listening right now, and I am so proud of you. There's a lot of different wellness champions listening also. 
So she went from a walker, you no know, drive, she couldn't drive anymore, she couldn't work anymore. Now she's working and she's driving and she's traveling and she's living her life and she was hiking and she can do jumping jacks and she can do whatever she wants because she treated the infections and she I'm sure can tolerate the heat because she's has no more issues. Awesome. So Rob, the key is that you did ozone therapy and I told you before that ozone therapy, I really like it, but it's not going to treat the parasitic infestation that you have. And then we do become worse, right? So ozone will be helpful for things like a little bit of Lyme disease that, or Borrelia that's in our blood for sure, some different, uh, maybe protozoa, for example, but it's not enough to treat your intestines where a big part of them are, or it's not enough to treat even in the central nervous system. So it's really important that you follow like the treatment part, right? The eating plan is one thing. It, there is no eating plan in this world that will treat the infections. You have to treat the infections. Hi, David. How do you eradicate the worms? It is not easy. Like the more I'm doing a lot of research on this and looking at different types of, because we don't know the exact species at this time of the microflarial worms. And I'd have to say too that with my students, they're not all using the same antiparasitic treatments. They're getting tested. And it's interesting, some of the students, like one student, she has uh, goats that she gets the milk, the goat milk from her goats. And she tested well for the antiparasitic treatments that she uses on her goats. So interesting how we very often will pick up parasites from our pets also, or from if we're on a farm, for example. So the unfortunate thing is, David, that it's not always a one-size-fit-all treatment for parasites for even multiple sclerosis. I wish it was. There are some common helpful treatments, but it is not a one-size-fits-all issue. And then, you know, the more we study the, the treatments, we're seeing, you know, some of them will treat maybe the adult form or the immature form, but it won't treat the adult form. So then you have to com combine different treatments together. Um, and then some of them are sitting in egg form and some of them are on, under biofilms. And so we have to deal with biofilms. So it's quite a process to get rid of them. And again, it's not just the worms. And so a lot of times the worms are requiring a bacteria that they live together. They need each other for reproducing and carrying on their life cycles. So a lot of times we will be dealing with the bacteria that the worm needs to live off of also. So that's, this is what I'm sharing is probably in 10 years, it won't be this complicated because we will have a lot more researchers all over the world, you know, working at, it's just that we have ignored parasites in North America and the European countries, all my students in different countries in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, it is so hard to be treated for parasites. Our medically trained doctors are not experienced at this time. They're not being taught this in school. The pharmacies don't carry most of the old treatments that were used for many years. And so this is, it's a really big problem. And that's why students work with me in the live disease free system, because it's really hard to figure this out yourself. Walter, what did you do to get rid of the worms? So we are using a combination of things. So we're using various antiparasitic drugs and I cannot say names of drugs right now because that would be irresponsible because I don't know if the, whoever's listening, I don't know if you have that specific um, worm or parasite but we're using antiparasitic drugs. The sicker a person is, then very often they will test well for three to five antiparasitic drugs at one time. And then we're also using oxidizing agents. It's like an oxygen type agent um, to also help breaking up biofilms and to be treating Lyme and to be killing smaller single cell parasites because we can have protozoa, which are single cell parasites also. So again, the sicker we are, the more variety of different types of bacteria, fungus, and parasites we have. And so we're kind of trying to figure out which are the biggest culprits and knocking them back and knocking them back. And so we're, again, we're using drugs and we're using herbs, but the herbs on their own are not enough and the drugs on their own are not enough. 
And the combination of the two, if you don't follow the eating plan and support the body, aren't enough. So we're doing a combination of things. And then sometimes people will benefit from a little bit of pulsed electromagnetic therapy, just some little things on the side. Uh, what else? Light therapy, things like that. So it's a combination. It's a layering of therapies. And those are the people that have the most success. Hi, Kelly B. Hi, Kathy. And Lindsay, okay, let's see if there's any last questions and I'm going to let you guys go. How do you get someone to help you in treating infections? Um, Patty, that is the hard thing right now. Um, just watch my master class training. Watch some of my videos. Watch my master class training. Um, you can go around and ask, but the problem is, is that when you go to, it's usually like an integrative practitioner, and at this time, you'll go to them and they'll say, okay, well, let's look at your hormones. Let's do heavy metal detox. Let's look for food allergies. Let's do this and that. And, and it, it ends up being super expensive. Like it can be easily be a thousand dollars a month for several months and you still have the parasites. And that's what most of the people have found when they come to me is that they've done CCSVI, they've done stem cell, they've, done all of these other things that integrative and they're still really sick because they've never treated the parasites and fungus and the Lyme disease, etc. in the right order. So it is really challenging. We have like in the live disease free system with my students that I'm working with, we have a practitioner's members area that we are sharing with practitioners and we're sharing everything and we're building a network, but it is, it's just like ground level right now, unfortunately. Hi, Catherine. I have no idea what that is. Hi, Don. Oh, you have a dog behavior training center. That's exciting. I love dogs. So you don't know why it's showing me and my training too. Oh, sorry. I don't know. It's just, okay, Marissa. Hi, Marissa. Hi, Michela. Let's see if there's any last questions. Is kefir good for us, Helen? I would avoid kefir because number one, it is a dairy product. And number two, it contains a lot of natural yeast. And my students that have chronic disease, there's always fungal overgrowth. And although the, the different types of funga, fungus, the yeasts that are living in kefir are not the ones that will give you a yeast infection, but fungus will benefit from it in your body. So, and the whole dairy part, we avoid all dairy except for butter until people have recovered. Once you're well for a good length of time, then you could test something like that. But in the recovery phase, we would not have it for sure. Hi, Chantal. You are very, very welcome. Hi, Stephanie and Bill. So chlamydia pneumoniae is another one. So that's another type of bacteria. And I haven't, this is the thing, is that it can become where they're measuring it and testing for it, and they are putting people on antibiotics and having some benefit. The problem is they have to be on it for months and months and months, and then these critters become resistant to antibiotics. And we don't know, is it the chlamydia pneumonia that's the problem, or is it the Lyme infections, the co-infections with, with uh, Lyme disease? But again, we don't go after the bacteria like in the forefront until we're addressing the parasitic infestation and the fungal overgrowth for sure. Um, you can be doing that alongside, but we found that the antibiotics are not very effective long-term success. So you've had MS, uh, Jiju, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. You've had MS for 11 years, but you haven't taken any medication. You feel okay, and you just have a problem with balance, and heat does affect you occasionally. So what I would do if I were you, I'm really happy that it has not affected you a lot yet. But the fact is I've spoken with over 700 people that suffer with multiple sclerosis. Some people have had five or 10 years of good life where the MS was not very active and they just thought, oh, I'm a lucky one. I've got the, you know, not an aggressive form of kind of like a benign form of MS, but there's a time in their life when things change. So when you have multiple sclerosis and you have, if they've diagnosed and they found the lesions in the central nervous system, that means that you've got parasites and 
possibly Lyme disease and fungus in your central nervous system. And your body has been managing it for these 11 years. But as we get older, and as we go through times of high stress, not sleeping well, uh, going on antibiotics, eating the wrong foods, on and on and on, the infections do become stronger and stronger, and we end up getting relapses and attacks. And so even for people that have been really good for, let's say, 5, 10, 15 years, the vast majority of them, I would say probably over 90, 95% of them, they end up with the MS becoming a problem. So what I would do if I was, if I knew I had multiple sclerosis and I was in the early stages, I would treat the infections right away because that way you are guaranteed that it's not going to progress. But if you just carry this infection load with you, that circumstances in your life, getting older and all those other things I shared with you, they are going to result in the infections causing the, re the attacks for sure in time. So that is my advice to you is treat the infections now while you still have very minimal damage, if none at all yet. Hi, Michael in Texas. Hi, Rob. You're very welcome. Mitchell, I think that's it for hello from Lisa in Alberta. Overheating makes you feel horrible. So that's why you haven't, and you haven't sweat for years, Elaine. Tim, hi, you can handle, you can't handle the heat either. So I just want to tell you that there is hope for you. If you can't handle the heat, you have to treat the infections and it's not a cakewalk. It's not easy. And that's why people love to work in the live disease free system because it's a constant myself between doctors and pharmacists and just finding the right amounts. The sooner you treat it, the easier it is for sure for most people. But there are some people that really surprise me that, you know, in 90 days, Terry Carly was out of her scooter. She was in it for several years. So I can never make promises, but I know when you treat the infections, the disease process stops. You'll have a lot of recovery and the being able to tolerate the heat again is one of the ones that you will be able to also have. So Natasha, all you have to do is listen to my masterclass training, and then we'll send you some information. And if you're ready, like you'll fill out a little form, and if you're ready, then you can chat with me, you can get started right away, um, but there's a little process. So just listen to my masterclass training where I explain a lot more about the infections. Hi, Kim. Hi, Kayla. What is the treatment? It's, I shared it on the call. It's quite complicated. It's not just popping a pill. I wish it was. If it was, trust me, I would be telling everybody. Hi, Danielle Marie. Okay, I think that's it. Does this work for other problems? Yes, Rob. Absolutely. A lot of it is parasites. I, we've known fungus for years, candida for years, for sure, and other fungus like aspergillus mold, but there is a huge parasitic component to chronic disease. Any doctors I'd recommend in North Dakota? No, I'm sorry, Patty. I don't know of any right now off the top of my head. Hi, Mia. Do you get the parasite treatment meds online? Um, no, you have to get them through pharmacies. So that's the key. You have to get them through pharmacies. And Danielle has posted my masterclass training in the feed, so you can see it there. Ruben. Um, so you have to listen to your body, Ruben. If you're out in the sun and it really bothers you, don't, definitely don't aggravate your symptoms. For the vast majority of people, if their symptoms are a little stronger when they become overheated, when they cool themselves down, it does settle down for sure. But if you push through negative things, you, you never know. It definitely could cause long-term damage. So just listen to your body. And if something isn't working, don't do it. So don't stay out in the sun if it's causing really strong symptoms. You live in, should I stay out? Should I stay out? You live in Florida. Again, go out right now in the early morning, go out in the late afternoon. If it's cool enough yet, listen to your body. Everybody's different, right? So listen to your body, but treat the infections. Reach out and treat the infections. Hi, Tammy. There are There is one on the West Coast and... Again, I don't want to recommend them right now on, on the call just because I just feel bad doing that because it doesn't have to cost forty to $80,000. There's one in Arizona. There's one in, on the West Coast um, in the Seattle area. But again, 
it really breaks my heart when people are spending that kind of money because it's not necessary. And honestly, when you learn the skills yourself, you'll have it for the rest of your life. You'll be able to keep the microbes in balance so you can avoid future chronic disease. That's how I've been able to live MS-free for the past 30 years now. I think that's it. Um, Gret, you're wondering if we've had people come out of a wheelchair and walking again. So there have been a few. I can never promise. Um, we've had like Terry Kylie is one and Maria is another one, came out of scooters and wheelchairs. But the key is, and walkers, etc. but the key is that we're still in the learning phase, right, as far as treating and getting better at treating, especially the longer you've had chronic disease, the more deep-rooted these infections are. And so we have to treat them differently. And so that is, you know, like the people that have had it for 20 or 30 years, you still can stop the progression. You can still have a ton of recovery, but I can never promise full recovery. But we have had people come out of wheelchairs and scooters, absolutely. Interesting, you've been diagnosed with Lyme disease a couple of years ago. Yeah, for, so that is, that is the key, is that I've had students that have Lyme disease but no MS, and they were treated by Lyme litter doctors, lots of antibiotics, not getting better, sicker, 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 treat the parasites, the fungus, several times, and yes, knock back the Lyme, but just treating Lyme by itself is not going to give you the success you want. Hi, Victor. Hi, Ellie. Hi, Allison. Patty, Stephanie. Um, at this point, I can't recommend a lot of doctors, especially on the Facebook Lives, but that is something that we do, that people that work with me. And like I said, we are, in, we are like in the trenches. Like we're blazing a trail through the, through the forest as far as you know, getting, working with practitioners and sharing with them all the research and the protocols and what's working. So how do you, um, do you know much about the starch diet, um, Kaz? If you are on a starch diet, if you have chronic disease, it will make your symptoms a lot worse. So we go low, low carb and watch some of my training videos about the eating plan. You'll feel a lot better when you go low carb, lots of vegetables, but low starch for sure. Okay, yeah, lots of questions here. Your wife has dealt with progressive multiple sclerosis for 26 years. She uses a walker in the house, and can you help reverse the progression? Yes, absolutely. She's still walking, so she's only going to have more benefits. I, can I promise full, full recovery? I can never promise full recovery, but if she's walking, she will continue to stay walking. My students, they feel so good. They are able to come off their medications while they work with their doctors, and they just feel so much better. And if you want to watch some of the, the successes, go on to livediseasefree.com and you will be able to go through. You can listen to videos and audios of people that have wellness champions that have been through the program, livediseasefree.com. And you'll love it. It'll bring tears to your eyes. So absolutely. Gail. Hi, Cheryl. And yes, it definitely will help. The program will help with four fourth stage Lyme disease. Absolutely. You're very welcome, Rob. And Bill, the treatment is a twofold process where two antibiotics are given on a regular basis and third antibiotic kills the, that bacteria. So the problem is, Bill, that, oh, his wife was cured of MS in about a year. So this is where I don't know who this person is. If it's that doctor that discovered that bacteria, um, his wife was not cured. I'm not sure. This might be a different person. I do know that for some people with MS that have had their first initial attack, if this is research coming out of Calgary, if they put them on an antibiotic uh, for a few months, if they've only had that one attack and they don't have like a firm, you know, like MS progressing, relapsing, remitting, whatever, but suspect MS, that the incidence of MS is a lot lower if they give them this antibiotic for several months. And what I believe is that, you know, when you are dealing with, again, like Bill, make sure to look into this, look into the research about the parasites. It's a really big part. Um, if you kill the bacteria that those parasites need to 
complete their life cycle, then that will help. But I have looked at many, many, many people that have done lots of antibiotics and it has not been a cure for them. So go ahead and send me that, that, that uh, person if you want to send me that doctor or whoever it was that treatment. But because I'm always researching, but honestly, like with Lyme, with MS, just antibiotics is not giving us the life that we want for sure. Hi, Morris. Hi, Ruben. Okay, have people with problems, have people, sorry, have people with problems walking, have they ever improved? Morris? Yes. Yeah, lots. Like Danielle is just one person that I just shared. She's listening in. And so she went from like a walker and not being able to drive and not being able to work. So those kind of things very, very often. And like I said, we've had a few coming out of scooters and wheelchairs. But things like spasticity can be completely resolved. Balance can come back. Drop foot can be recovered. Uh, the strength in legs. So all of these things can happen. It's just how effective. And that's the exciting thing is that although I can't promise full recovery, we are seeing that with respect to mobility, you can have a lot, usually you can have a lot more recovery than you thought possible. So when we're finding the right balance of treatments, like one woman's hand was clenched for 40 years and it opened up. And I would never think that that's possible. So we have so much to learn about these diseases as far as is it permanent damage to the myelin sheath? Very often it's no, it's not. And so we have to treat the cause and we have to be more effective. And oh, I wish we had a lot of money for, to, to really study these critters. So yes, they're chlamydia and ammonia. I'm very familiar with that. But Lyme seems to be a much bigger problem and chlamydia pneumonia could be in it too, but Lyme, the brillia, um, the vector-borne infections, the nematodes are huge because a lot of people are having incredible improvements with all kinds of MS symptoms, even just with the antiparasitic drugs. Spasticity, yes, you can get rid of that. You got to treat the infections. We find that the eating plan, if you follow it really, really well, a lot of people have less spasticity, but it is caused by the infection, so they have to be treated. Okay, and can I use caffeine? Okay, uh, we avoid caffeine for sure in getting well. Think about it this way. If you've got a lot of parasites and you're revving yourself up with caffeine, you know that it's really making them a lot more active and hyper, and that is not going to make you feel better. So we definitely stay away from there's lots of other reasons too. People with chronic disease usually have adrenal fatigue. And when they have adrenal fatigue, we don't need to be stimulating, right, the adrenal. So we avoid all caffeine. And as you stop feeding the infection, support the body, you should start to notice that the fatigue starts to lift already. Morris? Maurice? Uh, Leaky. You were diagnosed with MS in 2000 and you work full time. Uh, but your walking is not stable. Sometimes you I just, you get on plan to kill. And I'm not sure what you mean by that as far as treatment. Sorry, I'm not sure. Oh, here we go. So it's, I guess your symptoms are fluctuating. So again, what I would do is treat the infections. Yay, Michael, walking without your cane. Way to go. So Michael is another wellness champion, and he is um, he passed a ton of worms too. Um, all I have passed a ton of worms, like it's shocking. So it's amazing, and those are the big ones that we can see. And some of my students have passed over two feet long worms, anywhere between six inches to two feet. But again, those are not the ones that are causing the big, strong MS symptoms, but they definitely are really impacting our health and they have to go and we feel so much better when we get them out of so does fasting help if you have chronic disease then fasting isn't necessarily the best thing to do because you are already usually having nutritional deficiencies because of the parasites they affect their their freeloaders you've got too many freeloaders eating your food so the key is that when you have all these parasites we eat in a way that we eat regularly, but we're eating in a way to feed our body and not feed the infection so much. And that's where people start to notice improvement. And then as you treat the parasites, 
and you restore your health, then you can do fasting. And fasting is a healthy thing to do, but you do that when you're stronger and your, your microbes are much more in balance and you don't have chronic disease. Yes, Robert, we've had balance coming back in our students, absolutely. Are herb teas good as long as they're not sweet? Hi, Sue. You are very, very welcome, Mia. And that's it. I'm going to let you guys go. So next week, the topic is a lot of people are really interested in diet. And I purchased the Dr. Roy Swank. Uh, it is low-fat diet. I purchased his book around 30 years ago or close to, I, I guess it would be 30 years ago, maybe maybe 29 years ago, but it's very discolored and old, but I have his book and I tried that eating plan. And so I really want to help people to understand that diet and could it help? Yes, it can help a bit. And I, so I want to help to explain why and then what kind of concerns there are and the limitations of it, because a lot of people get really confused with all these different MS diets. So with that, I'm going to let you guys go and we'll see you next, next week. Take care and bye-bye for now.